Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 30. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or a sister, you will be liable to justice. And if you insult a brother or a sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go to hell. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. I got left out of the bulletin this week, but I'm going to remember. Who's going to pray for the preacher this morning? Okay, come on up, Miss Sharon. She wrote it down. That's fine. You can write it down if you want to, or you can just extemporaneously say what you want to. Am I wrong, or did you grow up Baptist? Is that you that grew up Baptist, Sharon? Did you grow up in the Baptist church? It's an old Baptist tradition, so. Did they do that in your church growing up, pray for the preacher? Okay, I only went to Sunday school, so she doesn't know what they did. Join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for sending Terry to us to lead us and comfort us and guide us to be better Christians. As she has helped us, we hope that we can return the support and comfort to her. We pray for her health, physically and mentally, to overcome the difficulties she's facing at this time. We give, please give her the strength to carry on with her personal and professional struggles and let her know that she's not alone but the entire congregation is behind her. We are so grateful to have her with us. Her messages have taught us that all people are welcome in this church, and we hope we make everyone feel comfortable and a part of the church. Please bless Terry and her mother, Hattie, and Terry's family, including that big black dog, Jesse. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Big dog Jessie really loves all the company she's had lately. So anybody who wants to have a big dog come and sit on your feet, come see my mom because Jessie loves company. Loopholes, aren't they fun? There's some great loopholes. If you go to Wisconsin, what do you think the drinking age is in Wisconsin? 21. Unless you have a kid. Because if you have a child under 18, you are legally able to buy that kid a drink in a bar or a restaurant or your home. You just have to show your ID. And if you're over 21, you can buy your kid a drink or two or three or 16, and they can just sit and drink at the table at the restaurant until they're 18. Because when they're 18, they're no longer in need of a guardian, and they can't then legally drink until they're 21. That's a loophole. North Carolina, 
You think public nudity is permissible in North Carolina? Anybody ever been to North Carolina and see people naked in the streets? No. But it's there's a loophole. If you're on your own property, you can be naked, which means you could dress as Lady Godiva and hang out Halloween candy, or not dress as Lady Godiva, as the case may be, and out Halloween candy, as the case may be, and uh, not be arrested as long as you're on your own property. You can flash your neighbors from your house if you like, as long as you're on your own property. Nobody can tell you what to do because it's North Carolina and they're free to do what they want to do, right? There's another state, I'm not sure which one it is, I can't remember now, that uh, you can be naked on the street as long as you don't do anything sexual like point to your private parts or touch them or anything like that. You're free to be naked in the streets. That's a loophole. Jesus does not like loopholes. <laughs> because look what he says. You know, the law says you can't murder, but I say to you, if you're angry, uh-oh, you're liable to judgment. That's a hard statement from Jesus, isn't it? You're liable to judgment for getting angry. Raise your hand if you have not been angry at somebody in the last week, the last day, the last hour. Some of you, I mean, getting your kids in the car to come here, getting your spouse dressed to church, I know. Everybody says, well, we're just so happy to be going to church. It's Sunday morning. Let's get up early, get dressed, and go to church. Everybody says, yes, Mom, yes. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? Oh, those loopholes get us every time. Now, we were joking in the office, Lambert and I get together. We work on music for a few weeks at a time. We looked at this a few weeks ago, and I almost called the sermon the Big Butts, which opened up all sorts of strange possibilities for hip-hop selections for his songs this morning. But we're not going to go there. But Jesus says, but I say to you, but I say to you, but I say to you, saying to us all that it's not enough, the letter of the law is not enough. It's not about being perfect, because that's what the Pharisees thought. They thought, as long as I can check off every box, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. What do we read this morning in our call to worship from the psalm? But happy are those who obey the law. We're happy if we obey the law. Not necessarily the speeding laws in Baltimore County or the red light laws, but you're happy obeying the laws of God. This whole set of lessons is about the law, isn't it? About how we do what we do and how we do what's right in God's eyes. Let me ask you this. Was the law given to free us or to punish us? I asked the kids. I got the right answer. Do you remember that? What was it given? Ms. Sarah, you had the right answer. Was it given to free us? Or to punish us, the law from God. To keep us safe, which is a freeing thing to keep us safe. To keep us in a right relationship before God and with each other. Because what do the laws say? You know the Ten Commandments. Let's have your, here's your Bible quiz du jour. What are, shout out one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not what? Commit adultery. Is that going to hurt anybody if you don't commit adultery? No. It's going to keep a good relationship between a husband and wife and then between them and God. What's another of the Ten Commandments? you got one. Honor your father and mother. Is that going to hurt you, anybody in any way? No, it's going to be a good relationship between you and your parents. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth. Now, even some people have parents who don't deserve honor in some sense of the word. But if you honor them, it's going to come to you as righteousness. Not, it's not going to be anything against them. What's another commandment? You shall have no gods before me. That's going to keep us all in a right relationship before God and each other. These are not things that are meant to punish us or harm us. They're things that are meant to give us fullness of life. But then we have this one that's, that gets me every time. If you're angry with a brother or sister, you're liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you're liable to cancel. If you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. Uh-oh, says Terry, who calls everybody everything but a child of God when she's driving. I've told you that's my big weakness. I'm driving along somebody to something stupid, and I'm like, you something, 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 something. Not child of God, not disciple, not you brother or sister of mine. I always say something worse than you fool. But is it about that? Is it about the letter of the law? Do you remember Jimmy Carter when he was asked if he had ever committed adultery in his heart by looking, oh my gosh, didn't that bury him? 
I remember seeing a newspaper headline when he said, yes, he had looked at a woman lustfully. Jimmy Carter um, admits adultery. Almost lost him the election. But the law isn't given for that kind of punishment. It's not given to do it. Because who can observe the whole law? Is there anyone here who observes all of the law all the time? All of God's law, even. Not even me, because I told you I have trouble driving when people do silly things. I have trouble not telling them they do silly things. Not that they listen, not that they care, but I'm screaming at people going down the road all day long. I've got to get over that. I really do work on that one. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not saying it to be funny. I work on that all the time. I will stop and pray immediately when I find myself yelling at somebody in traffic. But when I was a psychiatric chaplain at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which is in D.C., it used to be federal when I started there, and then it became District of Columbia. Everyone who is, enters a psychiatric facility against their will is entitled to religious services, care, and everything else. And we always had to evaluate people when they came in. But this was one passage that had to be cut, literally cut from Bibles on wards that were long-term wards. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Because people would literally do that if they thought they were pleasing God. But understand, I was there working with deaf patients and their ability to read in those days was not necessarily good because most of them were older than the law, the ADA law, the Americans with Disability Act laws that entitled everyone to an equal education opportunity. Some people didn't read. One woman in my unit learned the Bible and her father was a pastor by looking at the stained glass windows, looking at the stories told there and then going home and trying to find it in the Bible and match it up. She was there because she killed her children and tried to kill herself and she was rescued. Unfortunately, her children died. But she would have cut her hand off. She tried to do that once because she had done something to break God's heart when she realized it. It's tough, isn't it? Nobody can do all these things right. Do you think Jesus really wants us to pluck out our eyes and cut off our hands? I don't think so at all. I think what he's saying is, particularly a Jewish celebrating the hyperbole, you know, Oy, my mother was such a crazy woman. My husband is such a crazy man. That kind of hyperbole where you just say things that are just so far beyond belief. But Jesus wants to get their attention and says to them, it's better that you go to heaven with all without your hand than to go to hell with all your body parts intact. It's a tough teaching, isn't it? So how do you know what he's asking for? If you can't possibly fulfill all the law, what is Jesus asking for? And I think this is one where the answer comes from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. If you look at Deuteronomy, what does it says? Today I said before you a choice. Life and prosperity or death and adversity? Which one would you pick? Life and prosperity or death and adversity? Pretty obvious, isn't it? Or I, um, I've said before you, life and death, blessings and curses. What would you choose, life or death? You choose life. Blessings or curses, you choose blessings. Choose life, God says to the prophet. Choose life so that your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you in length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. There's something called ethics. Anybody ever take a class in ethics? Everybody who goes to seminary has to study Christian ethics. And some of you have heard me talk about my surrogate son, Sam. Sam Tryon is going on Monday and Tuesday this week. He said, I don't care if you're on vacation, you better be available to me 24-7 on the phone. Because this week he's being examined to see if he will be ordained an elder in the United Methodist Church. I think he's going to make it through, but his first session is ethics. Nobody does well. Isn't that sad that your pastors don't do well when they get to their ethics exam? Ethics is a real tough thing to describe and define. It's basically looking at what's right versus what is good. What's right versus what is good. What's right is what the law says. What's good is not necessarily what the law says. The ultimate example is if your children are starving and you steal food, is that ethically all right to do? If your children have nothing to eat and you're stealing food from someone who sells food at gouging prices and they have plenty, is it wrong to steal food? How many of you think it's wrong to steal food in any circumstance? Anybody? 
You don't think it's wrong? Oh, some of you are thinking, that's good. Frida's got her thinking face on, so you're up here like, hmm. Is it wrong or is it right? Or is it good? It's hard, isn't it, to decide, but God gives us a good choice. He says, choose life. Choose me. When it comes between you and your decision-making, choose me. Choose life, and you will choose correctly. It's tough, isn't it, to know what God wants. So how do we get there? I think we sang it, and we're going to sing it again. More love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This all my prayer shall be, more love, O Christ, to thee. We start to put God first and Jesus Christ first. If we look to him for our answers, he's going to tell us what is right, what is good, what we should be doing in any situation. And we have Paul who writes to the people saying, I wanted to treat you as spiritual people, but you're little babies in Christ Jesus. I fed you with milk, not solid food. You weren't ready for solid food. Even now you're still not ready. For you're still of the flesh. For as long as there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? That gets us every time, doesn't it? As long as there's jealousy and quarreling among you. And what does it say down here in Matthew? Jesus says, when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there and go before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister and come and offer your gift. I asked this at the first service. Let me see if you have the same answer. What would happen to our offering if we made that a requirement? That you can't, give a, you can't even give money to the church if you haven't reconciled your issues with your brothers and sisters sitting in the pews with you. I think we'd have a drop in offering, to be honest. Because people come to church and they hold grudges against each other. Anything that ever kills a congregation, it's grudge holding. I'm going to say that again. If anything kills a congregation, it's holding grudges against one another instead of forgiving each other from the heart, which means you've got to let go of some stuff so you can really embrace one another. It's hard stuff, Jesus talking about here. We like to think of Jesus saying just love everybody and everything's going to be good. That's what he's saying here. If you love everyone everything will be good. But to love people you've got to work at it. You've got to put Christ first in your life so that we're not saying I belong to the global Methodists. I belong to the United Methodists. Say I belong to Jesus Christ. Christ alone will teach me. People will say to me sometimes, oh it's very clear in the Bible. I've studied the Bible my entire life. There's not a lot that's crystal clear in the Bible, to be honest, because things contradict each other so that we have to, we have to work at it. We have to talk about it together. We have to make sure we know what we're saying. We have to listen to each other and learn from each other. But one thing is clear, that Jesus Christ came that we might love one another and have life eternal. We, um, we sang at the first service. This was not part of today's lesson or... or, or music, but we sang Good, Good Father, which is a beautiful newer song in the Christian repertoire. And I told them all that it just every time I hear that song, it takes me to the parable of the prodigal son, the son that went off and spent his father's money. Because I used to tell people when I was introducing them to sin and salvation, I used to start the traditional way with Adam and Eve in the garden. That would be the, what you teach kids in confirmation classes. Imagine a 12 and a 13 year old sitting there. It's sort of like the laws in North Carolina said, we're two naked people and a talking snake. They look at you like you're crazy because it does sound crazy, doesn't it? Even to people who did not grow up in the church, it sounds crazy. There were two naked people and a snake walked up and said, why don't you eat this apple over here? And the woman says, all right, I'll eat it. And the man says, okay, whatever you say, honey. That makes no sense. But if you say to people, there was a father who had two sons. One was goody two-shoes, did everything right. The other totally hit the wall, screwed up, was miserable. Finally, when he had wasted everything his father had given him and thought his father could not possibly love him anymore, he turns toward home and he sees his father with his arms outstretched running to him. That is who God is for us in Jesus Christ. That is who God is for us in Jesus Christ. That's why God gave us the law to keep us in a good relationship with each other before God. But God always calls us to a higher standard. So it's not enough just not to kill somebody. And how many of you have ever threatened to kill your child or your husband or your wife? I could just kill him. I've heard people say that, jokingly. But this week it comes home to us that we're not even supposed to joke like that, are we? 
that if you're angry with them, that's just in God's eyes as deadly a sin. Because sin does not fall under felony or misdemeanor. Sin is sin. Jesus Christ is the standard bearer. If we look to Christ, he will give us what we need to say no to the brokenness of the world and say yes to God. So let's close some of those loopholes, shall we? And please, if you go to North Carolina, keep your pants on. Even if you own property there, keep your pants on. And if you go to Wisconsin with your child, don't buy them a drink. Buy them a root beer. Amen? Amen.